How do you stop police searches? This video is intended to be a basic guide to give you kind of the nuts and bolts of here's the different types of searches, here's how you raise your rights. So guys, let's get into it. One of the most common situations that a lot of folks find themselves in or what we call the knock and talk. This is where you're minding your own business, you're at home, you're browsing the internet, you're whatever it is, and you hear that knock on the door, you go up, it's the ATF agent, it's the police officer, the sheriff's deputy, it's whoever it is. If you choose to open the door and talk to them, this is what we call a consensual encounter. In other words, you didn't have to open the door and you can close the door and stop talking to them any point in time. Officers and law enforcement may use the knock and talk strategy when frankly, they don't have enough for anything else. They don't have enough probable cause to come in. They don't have enough to detain anyone, you name it. This could be them just simply trying to go what we call fishing in the industry here as an ex-state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. In other words, the cops are on a fishing expedition just to see, hey, I don't have anything here, but I'm gonna throw my hook in the water and start talking to these people and let's see if I learn enough to take some next steps. Now, those next steps could be against you or someone else. That doesn't matter. But the point is that that's what's going on with a knock and talk. Now, you may have heard me in other videos talk about the fact that officers are allowed to lie to you about almost anything. That is true. But this is one of those rare occasions where they cannot lie to you about certain things. There are some lines that they cannot cross. One of those lines comes thanks to the United States Supreme Court case from 1968 called Bumper versus North Carolina. In that case, the Supreme Court struck down a search as being illegal because law enforcement lied about having a search warrant. Now again, let's recall, if you resist a search warrant, even if that warrant is subsequently ruled in court to be illegal, you could potentially be prosecuted for resisting the warrant, which is a crime. So when the cops in the bumper case lied about having a warrant, they essentially compelled a search by telling the subject that they had no choice but to stand back and consent, or if you resist and do not consent, you're risking arrest if we actually do happen to have that warrant court said no go can't do that police but that's interesting and it's going to put a couple issues i want to talk about on your radar the first one is when does a knock and talk turn into a non-consensual encounter well a simple question of am i being detained in a polite and respectful way should get you that information if the answer is no you're not being detained then that means you are free to close the door if the answer is yes, then you are being detained. And by the way, that should be a giant red flag that your best move at this point, don't consent to any searches and stop talking without your lawyer. Oftentimes for what it's worth, law enforcement will basically try to not answer that question. They'll circle talk you, they'll divide your attention by asking other questions and so forth. This is where you just need to understand did you get the answer to the question, yes or no? And you can keep trying to drag it back there and you can get into a game about that. More on that in another video if you'd like. But I also just want to mention the fact that let's just talk about, for instance, if you're pulled over in your motor vehicle, in your car, and you're driving. Typically, in most states, when you get your driver's license, your proof of registration, whatever it is that they took from you, you know, towards the end of the stop, they give that back. It has been ruled in many locations that that basically ends the detainer. So the simple act of the officer handing you back your information, your driver's license, and so forth, will convert the stop from a detainer scenario into a consensual stop at that point in time. So that's something just to kind of keep in the back of your mind as well. Number two, and this is going to branch into a lot, and this is going to be really important, but let's talk about searches. The Fourth Amendment requires that any search or seizure must be reasonable. The Supreme Court has ruled that a search without a warrant starts as being presumptively unreasonable and therefore illegal. That's great. The bad news is that there is a laundry list of exceptions that, trust me, law enforcement officers are trained in and you most likely are not. Let me quickly go through what those are and give you the crash course on each. First, warrant. This is when a law enforcement officer actually gets a warrant from a court official like a judge or commissioner based on probable cause described in the affidavit or sworn statement in support of that warrant. Keep in mind that telephonic warrants do exist in many jurisdictions. Again, more on that in another video if you want. 
let me know in the comment field. Now, warrant laws are generally very strict and technical and formal. And just so you know, that can lead to a lot of technical challenges down the road from your attorney in court, where if the officer literally failed to dot their I's or cross their T's, so to speak, that can result in some major problems with that warrant. Now, when you are served with a warrant at the scene, it will often not include the probable cause section. What is my saying in English? You will only get the order but not necessarily the story about why you are getting the order. Now, that will be frustrating. Don't fall for the trap of resisting. Be polite, but reserve your rights by stating clearly and politely that you are not consenting to any searches or making any statements without your attorney, but you will also not resist law enforcement from fulfilling and executing their warrant. Keep in mind, you can still be arrested for that even if the warrant gets thrown out in court. Guys, really quickly, if you just caught us browsing through, be sure to hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any of our future content. And the best way to show your support, not only for this message, the constitution, the amendments, the bill of rights, and this channel, hit that like button. I look forward to joining in the comment section after this video, back to it. The next one, search incident to arrest. Very quickly, if you are arrested, you and often the immediate area around you, including individuals sometimes, can be searched incident to that arrest under a number of circumstances for a number of different reasons. Now, how expansive this search is allowed to be, frankly, this ebbs and flows with time. If you go back about 15 or so years, basically, this strategy by law enforcement was find a reason to pull over a car, find a bunch of people in that car, run all their IDs, find someone with a warrant, and then suddenly you can search basically the entire at a minimum, passenger compartment of the car, oftentimes the trunk, depending upon where you were, as a search incident to arrest. Now, the court in Arizona v. Gantt basically put an end to that of, look, search incident to arrest isn't just a license to search the whole car. Unfortunately, more than a decade on, other courts have gone ahead and have put a bunch of small chinks in the armor of that search incident to arrest by creating another long laundry list of exceptions. And we're more or less back to the point in many jurisdictions where those exceptions have swallowed the rule. And generally speaking, any search incident to arrest means that officers are gonna be able to search a lot of different things. Just keep in mind, this is one of those things that with time will ebb and flow. As the Supreme Court knocks things down and then the lower courts build back up those exceptions, we're back up to here. We'll see if the Supreme Court takes any action on this in the years to come. The next one's the consent search. If you consent, they can search. Law enforcement is under no obligation to warn you that you are free to refuse this search or that in many jurisdictions, you can actually withdraw or restrict the consent that you are giving them during that search. Now, keep in mind, any withdrawal of consent or restriction of that consent to search must be clear and unequivocal. Police are not required to conduct their search within your view or in such a manner that you can actually withdraw that consent. So they can they can step aside or do things outside your view so you're not able to withdraw your consent. That's all part of the game here. The actual suspect does not need to be the one giving the consent to search. This comes up a lot when you're talking about searches of homes, apartments, stuff like that. It can come from someone with basically sufficient apparent authority, such as a co-occupant of a home in the case of a house search. Some of the crucial test language that we see from the courts includes the phrase, quote, common authority over or other sufficient relationship to the premises or effects sought to be inspected, end quote. In a nutshell, any adult that you live together with or even someone who might just be staying over may be able to give law enforcement enough of a legal permission to have that search stand up in court. Keep that in mind. Plain view or the plain view doctrine. This is one you may have heard of before. The three prong Horton test, which comes from the 1990 Supreme Court case called Horton versus California. This basically cemented the earlier 1971 Supreme Court case in Coolidge versus New Hampshire requires basically three things in order for plain view to be lawfully upheld. And plain view is generally, hey, the officer's just walking past your car. They look inside and they see something illegal. They see contraband on the seat or maybe they were in your home for a legal reason and they happen to see something sitting out that's illegal and shouldn't be there. That's plain view. So it's a three-way test. Number one, the officer is lawfully present at the place where the evidence can be plainly viewed. Number two, the officer has a lawful right of access to the object 
And number three, the incriminating character, the object is immediately in parent. So it's not like they saw a computer, they have to search your computer to find something illegal. It has to be immediately in parent. Now, first, this doctrine only eliminates the warrant requirement, not the probable cause requirement. And second, something to keep in mind, the doctrine only authorizes seizure of contraband or evidence, as I already mentioned. So this doesn't authorize further search or additional investigation, at least not by itself. The next one is the automobile exception. Now, this comes from a 1925 Supreme Court case called Carroll versus United States. The idea here, and again, as with all this, don't blame the messenger, is that we have a lower expectation of privacy in our motor vehicles than we do in our home due to, well, and no small part as courts have pointed out, a long list of regulations that affect how cars operate and all that kind of stuff. Again, don't blame the messenger here. The courts have also noted that there is something of an inherent exigency in cars since, unlike at least most homes, they can leave a scene. And yes, some courts have, by the way, because I can feel those comments coming, some courts have ruled that law enforcement officers still do not need a search warrant, even if there is little or even no risk that the vehicle can be driven away at that point in time. This next one's very simple, the border search exception. Low resolution, if you're crossing an international border, you can be searched. No warrant or probable cause required. The last one I'm gonna talk about here, exigent circumstances, and this is a big one to understand. Here's the premise. If probable cause exists and there are exigent circumstances, then law enforcement may make entry. That's what we're talking about here. Now, it's important to understand there's no bright line test as we would call it in law. There's no, if this particular rule or formulation of the rule is crossed, then bam, we can go. There's no mathematical equation, which always stumps people from STEM fields and science and math and all that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, but this is a hardcore exercise in the liberal arts of what we're talking about here to determine if and when exigency exists. Instead, the courts look to principles. As one court put it, quote, an emergency situation requiring swift action to prevent imminent danger to life or serious damage to property or to forestall the imminent escape of a suspect or destruction of evidence, end quote. That's an idea of what exigent means. I have a different way of explaining it. Generally, we look to three different types of situations to be exigent or that could become exigent. One deals with the concept of emergency aid. Think about a police officer watching grandpa keel over just inside the front door or inside the, the windows of the house or something like that. That can create a medical exigency to break down the door and go inside. Another one would be hot pursuit. So if the police are actively chasing a suspect and that suspect breaks into your home, police can now make entry into your home because of hot pursuit. Again, hot pursuit, not cold pursuit. They can't have clues saying, hey, was someone here a year ago? We're gonna break in and go inside. Hot pursuit, not cold pursuit. And lastly, destruction of evidence. And this is definitely the big one out of all these. The definition of what constitutes destruction of evidence is obviously based entirely around what kind of evidence we're talking about. So if you think about classic movies like Goodfellas or something like that, an early 90s mobsters movie, if you're suspected of trafficking cocaine and suddenly all the sinks and toilets of your house start flushing and running, that could be destruction of evidence. Just to steal one from Hollywood there. Taking together in my career, ex-state prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, I started what's now the largest criminal defense firm in the state. I employ close to 30 attorneys at this point. I would rank the most common methods for search that I see anecdotally in this order from most common to least common. Number one, consent. Number two, incident to arrest. Number three, plain view. Four, automobile exception. Five, exigent circumstances. Usually we're talking about destruction of evidence. Number six, although some people may not call it an exception, but I'll just label it here as one, that's warrant. And look, I'm in Wisconsin. I don't deal with border searches. Maybe this is a big deal for folks in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, North Dakota, Minnesota. I don't know. But we don't have international borders here, though sometimes, look, based on how Illinois drivers are driving across my state, I really do wonder whether or not Illinois is its own country, but 
I'll pause and let you take your best shots at Illinois right now if you want to in the comment field. Hopefully there's some good ones in there. Here's the bottom line. Now, this is all very obviously, and I really hope this is obvious, but I know it won't be for a couple people. This is not legal advice, and the laws do vary from place and time. So be a grown up, do your own research to see exactly what the laws are and the details are for your state and at your time that you're watching this video. Be sure to check all that out. Now to our ever popular quote of the day. This one comes from Mark Twain. The more I learn about people, the more I like my dog. And speaking as a dog owner, I can definitely empathize with that sentiment. If you just caught us browsing through, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to make sure you don't miss any future content. Show your support for the Constitution and all of the glorious amendments. Hit that like button. It's the best way of supporting our channel for absolutely free. I will see you in the comment section and in the next video. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content. And we'll see you in the next one.